Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And this is a video about uh, life, death, all of that sort of stuff in Malazan, uh, religion, beliefs, all of that sort of stuff. But I am going to do the first part of the video talking about some general concepts about the understanding of narrative that will feed into this, that will be of uh, hopefully of interest about different approaches that you can take that give you different perspectives on how this subject is treated not only in Malazan but in other works. So the first part of this video is absolutely spoiler free apart from I don't know like Star Wars and Highlander I think they're they're good examples of things um, and then I will talk about specifically Malazan and sort of relate it back to that. And the reason this all came up was that someone left, one of, the, one of the commenters left, very lengthy commentary on one of the videos. Because apparently this is a debate in the fandom about whether or not death in the Malazan universe has any meaning. Or can you just go, well, it's a, they'll, they'll just come back. Um, and it's, it's an interesting concept. So the, the first thing I want to talk about before we get onto the specifics of, of how it functions in Malazan is a general concept about knowledge, a general concept about character knowledge versus reader knowledge, and uh, also the framing of narrative events. So if we think about it this way, as a reader, you have knowledge that other character that the characters don't have because you're seeing multiple character perspectives, you're seeing an overview of a lot of the different things happening in the, in the novel. And when that happens, unless it is a, a first person narrative where you're solely always with one character and therefore your knowledge, your view of the world is, is focalized through that person. But when you have multiple POVs or when you have an omniscient narrator, you as reader are granted a lot of knowledge about events that specific characters don't have. And this can have a significant impact in the understanding of the text. Now, this is dealt with in, in um, critical theory. So what uh, I, uh, Wolfgang Eiser's gap theory deals with this, reader response theory deals with this. And I'm not gonna go into a whole theoretical debate. I, I just wanna talk about the sort of the general concepts. So you may have heard terms like dramatic I irony or tragic irony, and that's when a reader or the viewer or the audience member knows something that the character doesn't. So for instance, we know in The Lord of the Rings that Eowyn is a woman and the uh, Witch King of Angarach, the Nazgul, can't be killed by a man and declares this. And we're all sitting there going, yeah, but you're faced off against a woman and she ain't no man. That tragic irony. The character doesn't know something, the audience does know something, and it's going to have dire repercussions for that character. In a similar way, when we watch um, a film in which the camera lingers on something and, and we have a character say, oh, if only I had that thing, and then the camera sort of pans over and you know the thing is there and that they've missed it. The reader or the viewer is let in on something that the character doesn't know, and it may have dramatic or tragic consequences for the character. So that's dealing with this gap of knowledge between characters and viewers, readers, or as Iser would call them, narratives, the person that the narrative is being narrated to. So that's, that's one aspect. Now, we can actually split this out further because typically when we are reading or consuming or viewing a narrative, these narrative events, unless it's a very particular type of, of novel, are exceptional events. They are not the norm. This is not what the world that we are viewing or experiencing is usually meant to be. There is a difference between these singular people in exceptional events and what generally happens in the world. Because a, if you take a story about World War II, if you have something that happens in World War II and they're focused very much on telling you the story of this thing that happened, that thing is not normal. That is an exceptional event. That's why there's a story about it. 
So we have to remember that the event being depicted is not necessarily representative of the norm. It is exceptional. That's why there's a story that we're engaged with. There's a narrative that's been created all around this. It's something different. It's something exciting. So we have multiple levels of subjective knowledge within a text. You can have your everyday normal person who lives in a village in the middle of nowhere and some guy rocks up into town armed with all of these swords and they're like, that's really weird. But for the reader, it's not really weird. We've seen lots of guys with swords. We've seen an entire company of them. We actually know who this person is. We know what they're doing. We have followed their journey. So for us, that's a normal person. That's Dave. Dave's walked into town. Why are the villagers acting so weird? Because for them, normal life does not consist of these guys wearing weird armor and carrying all of these swords. Normal life doesn't have that. So when an author shows you that, it's establishing a base level reality for the world versus the narrative reality um, of what we as reader are used to and how the two aren't exactly the same. Even though when we read, we see all of these exceptional characters, we see these exceptional events, and it's very easy to fall into the trap of, well, this is what the world is. You go, no, this, and again, it's dependent on the narrative, but this is usually exceptional. It's usually different. It's usually not the norm. And the characters we view are usually not normal. And even when they take a normal character, they are shaped by exceptional events and end up not normal. The Lord of the Rings is a perfect example of this. We take three relatively well-to-do, semi-noble, privileged hobbits, Frodo, Merry and Pippin, and then a commoner, Sam, and they go on an adventure. When they return, Merry and Pippin are different. They're changed. They're, people look at them differently. They have been shaped by their experiences. So too has Frodo, but far less beneficially. And Sam, Sam is now different as well. They have been changed by their experiences because what they experienced was not normal. So if we use a thought experiment and we think, if we duplicated both of them, uh, both groups, or we, du sorry, if we duplicated the group of the hobbits and we kept one in the Shire, that they didn't go anywhere, they just carried on with their lives as normal, and the others went off on the Lord of the Rings quest and came back. Are those the same? Will they look at each other and go, oh, we're exactly the same? No, they're completely different when they come back because they changed and grew as characters. They were shaped by these exceptional events. So that being said, when we think of knowledge that characters have, we have to remember that character knowledge particularly when it's done well, is subjective. They don't have access to the knowledge that the reader has. So let's think of how this pertains to religion, death, all of these sorts of things. And we're going to talk in a general sense, and then I'll move on to the, the uh, Molasson stuff. So in Highlander, uh, the film with Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert, Connor McLeod at a certain point realizes he's immortal. So he knows he can't die unless someone cuts off his head. Spoilers for Highlander, it's been out since the 80s, whatever. So he knows he can't be killed. So if someone pulls a gun, he can step in front of someone and go, shoot me all you want, do, 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 and he'll pretend to fall down and die. And then when the guy's not looking, ha ha, he can jump up. No sacrifice, nothing. He knew he wasn't going to die. He knew, yeah, it's going to be painful. Like no one wants to jump in front of bullets. It doesn't desensitize him to the pain. So yeah, you still have to have some level of courage to step in front of a whole load of bullets that are going to hurt you. But he knew he wasn't going to die. It's not a sacrifice. Well, it's a small sacrifice. He ruined a shirt. Um, but his character knowledge, his subjective knowledge, he was absolutely 100% sure, factually, that he wasn't going to die. So he falls down and dies. And we see the little girl going, oh, because this person has just been killed in front of her. We can feel sorry for the little girl because she doesn't know that he's coming back. Nothing robs you of that. You can still feel sorry. You don't have to go, oh, Connor's dead. Oh, that's, that's a pity. Oh, he's back. That's, that's not what's going on on the screen. Connor McLeod falls down, the little girl, cries and she's upset because this person's just been killed and then he saves her and she's ah 
it's it's all a bit shocking. It's all a bit much. And we then find out that she's actually then dedicated her entire life to him because of that moment. He saves her life and there she then is his ward and then his friend and then almost like a mother figure to him. That doesn't change her feelings for him. She's not wrong to have those feelings because someone did do this for her. Someone did save her life. Someone did sacrifice something. Does it cheapen his death? Well, no, because he wasn't dead. Um, it didn't cheapen his death. But it, does it cheapen the idea of death? Because there are a load of people in, this, in the Highlander world who are immortal. Does it cheapen death? No, it, it doesn't cheapen death. Lots of characters do die. Very few of them, the exceptional ones, can survive. So let's think of Star Wars and, and A New Hope. Obi-Wan Kenobi faces off against Darth Vader, and in order to buy time for the others to get away, he sacrifices himself. He surrenders himself to the Force and lets Vader strike him down. And Luke is devastated. Luke is robbed of this guiding figure, this mentor figure. And you go, but they barely know each other. They, they spent like a week traveling together. How can it be that big of a deal? This person has stood up and sacrificed their life for Luke, someone he cared about. Someone was his last point of connection to Tatooine and his family and his history. He's now truly an orphan with no point of connection to his history. Should we feel bad for Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah. Should we feel even worse for Luke? Yes, because it's Luke's loss that we are empathizing with. It's not, I really liked Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm sad he's dead. You can have that feeling, but the major feeling that we're expected to engage with is the loss that Luke is feeling. That's why the camera shows Luke. It shows his scream. It's close to Luke. It's showing his reaction because it's not just about Obi-Wan's death. It's about Luke's loss. And that's the feeling that we identify with. But we know within 25 minutes, Obi-Wan's not really gone because he's a voice in Luke's ear. That's very mysterious. Oh, well, his sacrifice means absolutely nothing then, does it? Because he's like basically a ghost. So that's practically the same as being alive again. Really? And in, in Empire Strikes Back, he literally comes back as a force ghost. Like he's wandering around this blue ghost and you go, oh, well, but he's, he's not really alive. He can interact with the physical world and now he's immortal. Well, I feel, well, I feel cheated now. That's ruined death in this series. No one's death should matter anymore. Oh, Yoda died. Ah, that's all right. He's just going to come back as a force ghost. Again, Yoda's death. He, he dies. He's, he's not Yoda anymore. He, his spirit, an echo of it, his consciousness, something may come back, but it's not Yoda anymore. It is a version of Yoda. And even then, it's Luke's loss again. Luke finally found a new mentor. And when Yoda dies, he loses that mentor. Luke's loss. Luke is mourning. Luke no longer has these points of connection. So even if you go, oh yeah, well, Yoda's coming back. Is everyone a bloody force ghost? Oh, look, Anakin's back. Qui-Gon Jinn's probably going to come back. Jar Jar Binks, well, he's probably going to come back as well. Just because there is something outside of our perception of reality, our perception of metaphysical, uh, metaphysical understandings, just because that exists in a fantasy world or a science fictional world does not rob those things of meaning because it just because it doesn't fit with our understanding of our real world. If this was a real world novel, a real world setting, a mimetic story, then yeah, you might feel a lot cheated that these things were happening. But these stories are not mimetic. They're not representations of our world. They're not meant to conform to our reality. And so if we are imposing our ideas about what is metaphysics and what happens after death and what all of these things are, if we're imposing those on the text, then sure, the text isn't going to work for you the way that it does for people who actually engage with what the text is actually doing and is actually saying and is actually exploring because you're not engaging, you're refusing to engage with that because you go, my worldview is this and that's what I'm imposing. Now, are you entitled to do that? Of course you are. You're the reader. You can do whatever you want. 
Nothing I say is going to change that. But you've used your external perspective, your external knowledge, your extra diegetic or non diegetic. It's not part of the story. It's not part of the story world. And you're trying to game the story because think of the film Iron Man. Robert Downey Jr.'s character, Tony Stark, gets shot and he's bleeding out and lying on the ground. And you go, I wonder, is he going to die? No one wonders if he's going to die then. This is the start of the movie. We know there's an entire movie all about Tony Stark. We saw the trailer. We know he's not going to die. And you go, yeah, but in that moment, Tony doesn't know that he's not going to die. Tony's experience is real. We can still empathize with his fear and panic and confusion and fear of death in that moment. That doesn't ruin the moment knowing that, well, yeah, there's another hour and a half of the film to go. Of course, he's going to be fine. That's an incredibly cynical way to try and judge whether or not you have an emotional connection to a film or a character because you're not engaging with their subjective perspective. You're looking at it from a a metatextual or megatextual perspective that you're standing outside it and going, well, it's an action movie, so that thing's likely to happen and that thing's likely to happen. Now, one of the big differences between, say, Iron Man and uh, a fantasy novel, Iron Man is ostensibly set in a variant of our reality. The same basic rules of our reality apply until we start getting into like Doctor Strange and, and all of that sort of stuff where they bring in magic, where they bring in all of these other things, which moves it even further away from our reality. But they establish the rules that death in that world is permanent. Well, sometimes, usually, mostly. But again, when someone sacrifices, when a character sacrifices themselves for another character, we can A, feel that sacrifice, B, feel the other character's loss, C, understand that the character that did the sacrificing did not necessarily know that they were going to be brought back. So let's take a real world example. Um, you and a group of friends are out and uh, suddenly something comes flying that way. So you step in front of your friend to protect them. You get hit, your heart stops, you collapse and you hit the ground. You're dead. But it just so happens there's a paramedic nearby and they come running out with the uh, defibrillator pads. Charge, everyone back, and they bring you back to life. You died. And you come back and go, oh, I was going towards the light, but then I got brought back and I'm fine. And everyone goes, yeah, well, quit making a big deal about it. Like, you're fine. You didn't actually die. Like, what's the big deal? Like, let's all just go under the pub now. No, it's a traumatic event. Something traumatic happened. Your friends have a right to be shocked. Your friends have a right to be worried. Your friends have a right that suddenly they're confronted by their own mortality as well as your mortality. In that moment where you're lying there dead, they're allowed to grieve. And if that was a story, we as a viewer or a reader, we can look at that and go, oh, that, that, that's terrible. I feel terrible. Oh my God, they're dead. The, and oh, he's been brought back to life. Well, I feel cheated now. <sighs> Plot armor. Yeah. Like he just got brought back to life. Is that going to happen every time? De is it, are there just defibrillators? That, what, death has no meaning in this world. Because you take isolated incidents and you expand it and extrapolate it and say that this is the norm across the entire reality. And we go, it's not. So let's talk specifically about Malazan. And Although there are a load of, of different examples and things that I could deconstruct and talk about and analyze from later on in the series, I'm just going to look at Gardens of the Moon. So let's look at Riga. Riga, um, the wax witch, the very, very beginning. Her husbands are dead. Her sons are dead. And so she has these candles. And that's how she uses her magic to talk to the shades of, the ghosts of, the souls of, the consciousness of her loved ones. Well, I don't feel sorry for her. She hasn't lost anything. Like, she can still talk to them. No, they're dead. She can't hug them. She can't be with them. She doesn't get to come home at the end of the day and go, how was your day? What are we going to do? Let's have a hug. Are we going to sit and have dinner? I hate when you leave the toilet seat up. No, that's all gone. That, that's gone. She's lost them. But she has a point of connection where she can use her magic to talk to them. But she's still lost them. They're still dead. They're not coming back. You go, well, okay, well, that's, well, we'll let that one go. Then we have Paran. Paran 
goes into the city and gets knifed and killed. He dies. He's dead. And it switches point of view to we see him approaching Hood's gate. So let's use an analogy to our world. The pearly gates. You've died. You've gone to heaven. And you're walking up to the gates to enter heaven. And then someone makes a deal with uh, St. Peter at the pearly gates and says, no, no, we're going to stick him back in his body. And they yank you back and stuff you back in your body and someone has stitched up all of your wounds. You go, oh, well, death has no meaning there. No, he died. This is traumatic. And we're told that the healing that is done in his body is traumatic. The fact that his uh, soul or his spirit or his consciousness is stuffed back in there by a god is traumatic. He suffers PTSD. He suffers psychological ramifications. He jumps into bed with Tattersail, someone he doesn't really know because he's so traumatized by all of this. She's traumatized by what's happened to her friends and they seek comfort together. It's a motivating factor for why they end up together. But does that mean that his death had no meaning? It had exceptional meaning. And also, does this happen all the time? No. A god had to directly intervene which apparently, as it is laid out in the book, is rare and made a deal with uh, Hood's envoy at the gate, which is rare, and it was going to cost someone else their life permanently. So the cosmic scale still gets balanced. Someone is going to die. Someone who, who is close to Paran is going to die. We just don't know who yet. So is his death, oh, it has no meaning, death has no, well, someone's going to bloody pay for his death because that was the deal that was struck. What about Herlock? Herlock gets blown in half and is using his magic to hold himself together, to keep himself going. Quick Ben then comes up, has a marionette and rips Herlock's soul out of Herlock's body and stuffs it into a marionette. Oh, well, Herlock's death has no real meaning then because he's still alive. He's just a puppet. Yes, because puppets can go into the bar and, and have a couple of drinks and hang out with their mates. No, he's had his soul ripped from his body, damaged as his body was, and stuffed into a, pu uh, a puppet. And then when that puppet is destroyed, he's destroyed, his soul is destroyed, or it goes on and on its journey. We don't know. What about Tattersail? Tattersail dies. She dies. Her soul, her consciousness, as well as the souls and consciousness of other people, get stuffed into an unborn baby. But that unborn baby is going to amalgamate all of those souls. Those are Think of them more as memories. But Tattersail is dead. Tattersail is not coming back. There will never be Tattersail again. And if you want an analogy for that, if you've read the, uh, the book's by Frank Herbert of June. Spoilers for June, by the way. Baron Harkonnen dies. Alia Atreides have the, has the ability to go back through her genetic memory and speak to Baron Harkonnen. He starts trying to influence her. Oh, well, Baron Harkonnen, that's just cheap. Like, he's still alive. No, he's not. He's dead. Those are his memories, his spirit. Um, but he, he can manipulate her. He can, he can do things. He's trying to take over her body. Yeah, but it's not him anymore, is it? It, it's a version of him. It's a memory of him that still has some level of sentience. But he's dead. He's gone. It's not the same. And if you're applying a real world paradigm to this, you're missing the point of what is being explored. Questions about what is consciousness? What are souls? What lies beyond the veil? Things that we don't know. We do not have definitive proof for. But then you can say, well, people know that the gods exist. You go, well, some people know that the gods exist. You can walk into any city center, basically in, in almost every major city in the world, and there'll be someone on a street corner somewhere saying that they A, they talk to God, God talks to them, the end is nigh, and they, they'll preach at you. They're firmly convinced that they talk to God. Do you believe them? And, and this is not to gainsay anyone who has a spiritual, religious faith of any kind. But that faith is based on faith. It is a belief. It's not based on fact. And in the Malazan world, even though we as reader know that the gods exist, and we know certain characters know that the gods exist because they interact with them, the vast majority of people don't know this. 
if you're one of those villagers living in a little tiny village and a priest rocks up going, I'm a priest of upon and you have to do this because the God has told me to do this. They'll look at it and go, prove it. So he does some magic and they go, yeah, but Riga the wax witch can do that. And she doesn't say that the gods exist. How does that person know that the priest is genuine? They could just be a mage and a charlatan and a con man. So religion in the Malazan world is actually based on faith. It is based on this belief that they think the gods are real. These strange miracles and magical things happen, which they attribute to the gods. But the vast majority of people in the Malazan world don't know definitively as for a fact that the gods are real. So then take Paran. So Paran knows that he can be resurrected. And you go, it's a potential. Okay. So should he just not care now? You go, well, I'm just going to step in front of swords, stop them with my body and then kill them. And then, you know, I'll, I'll come back. No, because he doesn't know that it's going to happen again. It was incredibly rare. Resurrection in this world is incredibly rare. And people don't definitively know that they are going to get resurrected. They're not Connor McLeod. They, they aren't thinking, I'm just immortal. There are a bunch of characters that do think they're immortal. Um, and that's a different thing. So then you have the aspect of, but this seems to happen all the time. And I can't answer that question without going into spoilers about a whole load of the other books. So I don't want to do that. But again, think about the world as a whole the number of people that exist in this world and the number of times or instances that a certain character comes back in whatever form. Are they coming back without repercussions? Generally, no, there are severe repercussions for what happens. So it has a cost. Did the character know that they were definitively coming back? No. So how does that rob their sacrifice, if that's how it occurred, of meaning? They didn't know they were coming back. There was a percentage chance. You know that, you know, people have a, a chance of resuscitating you if you're in an accident. That doesn't mean you drive like a bloody maniac going, I'm going to be fine. They'll just resuscitate me. No, you try to avoid it because there's a chance that they won't bring you back. Think of Connor McLeod again. If there was a 50-50 chance that he would permanently die. And he still steps in front of the bullets to save the little girl. And get shot. He knows at a flip of a coin, he's not coming back. Does that change his level of sacrifice? Well, it certainly changes it. If there's 100% certainty he's coming back, it's not a sacrifice. But if it's 50%, what if it's 99%? There's a 1% chance that he might die. There's still a level of sacrifice there because he's still willing to die permanently to protect the little girl. If you then start weighing up percentage chances and going, well, at this level, it's, uh, it's no longer a sacrifice. You're missing the point because then you're trying to quantify the value of a human life. And you can do that. You're perfectly entitled to do that. I'm not saying that you're not, but think of what the narrative is actually doing. Don't, don't get caught up in gaming it by going, well, metatextually, this character is an important character and therefore they're and I know for a fact they're going to be later on in the series. Therefore, this is all plot armor. You go anything, any incident uh, in history, you take World War Two, you go to the end of World War Two and you pick out the survivors. Then you go to the start of World War Two and you write a story about those survivors. That's not plot armor. You already know who survives at the end. That's what you're experiencing when you read the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This story, the ending of it was known at the very beginning. It's not like this is happening in front of your eyes. This is the telling of a story from an ancient history in a faraway land. And these are the important characters to that story. So it's not plot armor when this stuff happens. There are exceptional circumstances. There are strange things that happen. There are coincidences. Just as take any soldiers who survived the Normandy landings in World War II and listen to their stories and you go, well, that's it. if I was writing that story, well, that seems remarkably convenient that the grenade landed in front of them and didn't go off. That's just plot armor. You go, no, that was luck. That was a defective grenade. 
when we see the numbers of people that die and don't come back, that don't have any of these things in the Malazan uh, Book of the Fallen, when we see the loss that characters feel when people die, we can identify with that. And when, on the rare occasions, statistically, that people come back in some form, they are usually changed. It is usually traumatic and they usually are not, oh, everything's fine. But all of this is dependent on your perspective of the text. And it's up to you. If you want to feel that way, feel that way. I can't change your mind. I can't do anything of the sort because it's how you feel about the text and you're perfectly entitled to feel that way. But you feeling that way is not the same as death has no meaning in the Malazan world because that is demonstrably false. You can feel, I don't think death has significant meaning. Absolutely fine. You feel that. But that is not the same as death has no meaning in the Malazan world. It's not even the same as death doesn't really have the same amount of meaning in the Malazan world that it has in our world. No, it does. But our concepts of death and the Malazan world's concepts of death are not the same. So, sorry if this is a bit rambly and ranty, but I, I hope you've enjoyed this and I will see you in the next one.